My name is Costandinos Cariglas. I'm coming from Alter Agility, my own startup for the past couple of years. And uh, well, today we're going to talk about organizational agility. I'm going to start with a question. Who wants to change? Who wants to change things? Perfect. You change with that person there. You change with the other person there. So, did anything happen? Did anything change? No. This is what happens when you try to solve a problem being part of the problem. So you need to think different. You need to perceive your products not as money generators, but as solutions. And eventually, money will follow. And I need the switch. Yeah. So what we're going to see today, we're going to cover together, and I'm going to share with you some insights, why organizational agility is important for organizations. I'm going to share some data from the industry. And then I'm going to walk you through the journey of assessing and evolving organizational agility in organization by sharing insights from a real life example uh, that was my a most recent case study that happened in 2022. The first reason why we need to evolve organizational agility is because things constantly change. How, what amount of change can you, our company, absorb? Don't answer it now, but just think how much of a change can you absorb? Do you have the agility, the flexibility to adapt to the recent market changes? Most recently, we see some developments. Banks are collapsing, stocks are falling, the industry is being affected, things are changing. So can we cope? Can we absorb that amount of change? Do we have enough data to predict? And how fast can we respond to change? They say that the bigger the ship is, the slower will turn. And this is actually just a myth. I was involved in one big project that a company of 2,500 employees, within 45 minutes, the information was traveling from the operational level to the sea level and back. You just need to rethink the way you work. You need to see how can I change or evolve in such a way so I can respond fast to these changes. We're living in a very complex world, especially in the fintech industry, in the forex industry, Many regulations, a product that we may launch may not be legal in one country, may does not comply with the regulations of Y country, and so on and so forth. So we need to take everything into consideration. Do we have what it takes to understand all the structures that are being involved, especially for companies that are global? And last but not least, and this is actually where the fatal crash usually happens. We have unknown paths. Do we have enough data to take the right decisions? Forget about the data pro-COVID period. Things changed. People changed the way they think. So we need to collect those data. And those data, they change on a daily basis. So taking into consideration all these four aspects is like you know it differently, maybe. It's what we called the VUCA world. So this is the VUCA world we are living. And we need to find ways to change. And uh, why we need to change, this is some statistics coming from the Standage Group, the Chaos Report. It happens every year. This one is from the 2020s, comparing after interviewing thousands of project managers, product managers, and companies in the States. And they came up with these results. We can see that traditional projects, they have success 26%. And 
And those companies that evolve their agility, they manage to increase their success to 42%. Now, the failure is not only losing money, but it's also losing opportunities. If we fail to deliver something on time, if we miss the deadlines that the market sets, and not internal deadlines, then we're losing a lot of opportunities and money. Why companies seek for agility? And these data are coming from the State of Agile report, and I can assure you from my experience in the field that this is usually the reasons why I'm being called in a company to do the transformation. They need to accelerate the time to market. The pace is so fast, things are growing and changing so rapidly that we need to increase their time to market. We need to accelerate. We need to have predictability. We need to lower the risks. So how do we mitigate the risks when we say, we have a new idea, let's productize it, and let's deliver it by X time? How do we mitigate the risk? What are the mechanisms we have in place to mitigate the risk. Now, if you choose to evolve your agility, you need to know that many things can go wrong. And many people can say that this is not for me. Call it Scrum, call it Kanban, call it XP, anything you want, name it. It's not for me, why? Because some things obviously are not being done correctly. And this is usually most of the reason the what and the why is not clear. Don't forget you're dealing with human beings. Don't ignore the human factor. We all want to understand what we are doing and why we are doing. We all want to understand how we are contributing towards the company's direction. Where do we fit in the big picture? And it's really important. We need to motivate. We need to keep people involved and engaged. These are some practices that are challenged with the number one coming, the company culture. Many times I get the complaint, you know, the culture in this company, mm, I'm not quite sure if it's going to work. Culture, it's a result of the system. So this is how the system works. So we get to hear that a lot of times. And the system, is a result of the structure of the company. So the way the company is structured, it creates a system that cultivates the culture. So in order to change that, we need to go back to the structure and start making evolvements. I usually avoid the word change because everybody fears when they hear the word change. What's in it for me? Am, am I going to keep my job? Am I going to be here after this change? Do I have to change my habits that I was doing for the past five years, 10 years? Why do I need that? And so on and so forth. So you create resistance. So you need to find this is how to keep resistance down. Usually, I get the question, but the way we set up the product, get the question, but the way we set up the product, we cannot have cross-functional teams. So how this is going to work? And the response to that is that we need to go even back. Set again the backlog in such a way that will support cross-functional skills and then set up the teams around it to be able to deliver autonomously without interruptions and fully focused and encourage and empower automation so you can deliver continuously. Why not? Organization says and evolve the agility of a company, of a huge organization or a small organization. Says and evolve the agility of a company, of a huge organization or a small organization. It doesn't really matter as long as they have problems and they understand why they need to solve them, why they need agility. So we start from assessing the organization. So we start assessing 12 components of the whole organization. And we set up this chart, which is a heat map, actually, which on the, on the vertical one, we have the strategic importance of the organization. 
and the strength, how weak or strength is this component. And we focus on this area. So the most important components which have the lowest power or the most, most of the problems, we identify them here. So this is how we prioritize the initiatives that will eventually become opportunities. Then we do a gap analysis. Where do we want to go? We set the vision, okay? Which doesn't mean it's gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take time, but uh, we need to have a vision there. And then we set the strategy. And at this point, leadership gets involved. Following this, we always face four mega issues. Now, we'll ask you to ask yourselves these questions. Prioritization, this is number one mega issue that we face in the companies. Does your company suffer from the everything is urgent culture? Mega issue number two, working product. Does your company suffer from missing the deadlines? Yeah? And a lot of other questions. How do you do estimations, planning metrics, so on and so forth? Mega issue number three, organizational refactoring, especially for startups that scale, grow. They forget to grow the knowledge. They forget to grow the experience. They grow only in number of people. And that gives us a result of building silos. And if that silo is on sick leave or vacation, and if this guy is married, usually they get divorced because they cannot do vacation. And the wife is like, leave the phone. Let us have some fun. But they can't. They are suffering. And this is called employee burnout. All right? So this creates lengthy and dysfunctional processes. How do you refactor your company as you go along the way? In the agile world, we call it kaikaku. It's a revolution change, a revolutionary change. We have the kaizen, which is small improvements. And at some point, eventually, when we reach the point that we know that we have red flags for silos for any issues that will give us lengthy and dysfunctional processes, then we kaikaku. Then we revolutionize again the company and we grow. And last but not least, culture. I would like to highlight this. Us and them, accounting and compliance, developers and testers, finance and marketing, us and them, at the end of the day, they are all part of the same company. If you fail, I'm failing as well. If you succeed, I will be successful as well. So we need to build a team of teams culture. And if we go on the other side, I usually get from executives, they don't care. I'm telling them this thing needs to be done by that day. OK. And that day never comes. There is a lack of accountability. Why? You need to make a culture analysis to find why your employees are behaving like this. There is always a way out. I'm going to show you the challenges of if we, ah. This is due to confidentiality. I cannot disclose the name of the company, but these were the challenges when they called me in. It's a company of 300 employees, approximately. So people were working on multiple projects. Each member was a team, a lot of delay, no predictability, delays, and so on and so forth. So these were mainly the challenges that we started. How did we address these issues? We set up the leadership teams. So we have two types of leadership. We have the leadership in the organization, and we have the leadership of the organization. Now, what's the difference? Leaders in the organization are the hands-on people, that they lead the teams by being part of the teams. And the leaders of the organization 
are the people that expect results, but at the same time empower you to give these results. And I'm going to give you an example. A product owner is accountable for the product, delivery, quality, right? I'm the CEO, and you are the product owner. And I'm telling you, I need this product by that day with this quality, etc., etc. We have an agreement. So you take it on you. After three weeks, I come and tell you, look, drop that priority, put this one. Why? Because I'm the CEO. You have to do it. And then I make another change. I don't let you do your job. I'm paying you to do your job, but I'm not letting you. So eventually, when we miss the deadline and we have low quality, it's your fault. So, yes, he's accountable, but he's not empowered. So this is what we need to understand. The leaders of the organization need to empower people to be accountable. We focused on three key variables internally on the organization. People, process, product. Who is your customer? Internal and external. How do you achieve results? What is the process? How do you measure your work streams? How do you identify the waste you're throwing money in the dustbin on a daily basis? How do you do that? And most importantly, what do you make? And I would like to add, why do you make it? And then we equipped the leaders with the six leadership levers. Now, I need to mention here that the six leadership levers are coming from the scrumming practices in the field, from many years in the field, and from John P. Cotter, that is uh, actually expert in the field of change management. First one, operational excellence. So we equip the leaders towards that direction, in the organization, of the organization. We do competitive analysis, competitive positioning, and we need to seek continuous improvement. Usually the response I get from CEOs is like, perfect, this is what we want. And then I go, we need to embrace failure. What do you mean? Failure? Mm -mm. You don't improve unless you fail forward. You need to reflect. So you need to embrace failure. Of course, you need to stop any fatal failures. Number two, customer centricity. Based on statistics, only 25% of the product features are useful to your customers. The rest of it just exists or is dark work. So check your priorities. Work closely with the customer. Develop your with the customer. Influence not for the customer with the customer. Influence and control. And usually when I say control, in an agile way of working, people are looking at me, but there is no control. It's only in traditional. No, there is control. It's not a chaos. And trust me, in an, in an agile environment, the discipline is much more than a traditional environment. So we need to decentralize decision making. We need to accelerate decision making. Behavior and mindset, and this actually also touch the recruitment. Do we recruit talents or experienced people? We need to choose which way do we want to go. Does this person fit in the team? One of the companies I was working with, the team itself was doing the interviews, providing feedback, and then the hiring manager was just giving the green light or if there is a serious reason, it was a red light. Productive conflict. Now, we avoid babysitting here, and we want to avoid babysitting. We don't want to report every now and then to the manager, and then the manager will call the other employee, and then go back, and then so forth. We let the people resolve their conflict by themselves. They are grown-ups. They know how to do it. Give them the tools to do it. Encourage them, empower them. 
And last but not least, the strategy deployment, which actually you set up this by collecting all the feedback from the previous five levers. And over here, a vital role, both agile leaders of and in the organization play a vital role. Now, these are the results we achieved initially with the company I mentioned at the beginning. After four weeks data, we said that we're delivering on month eight and nine. All right? The deadline was month seven. So we knew from the first four weeks that we are about to fail after seven months. Amazing. We don't reach the seventh month to find out that we are not delivering. We know it from now. After working with the people, coaching, guiding, mentoring, after eight weeks, we accelerated. And after 12 weeks, we even delivered earlier. Prioritization of the product was a vital part of this. Teamwork, HR was involved, highly involved, transformed to people operations, being reactive, being proactive, not reactive. Metrics, these are the metrics we maintained. So we built a beautiful dashboard for the management and the leadership, and they knew what was going on in the company with numbers. The happiness, the planning, EMPS, capacities, impediments, so on and so forth. And the benefits, better decision making. Because I know, and this is how we achieved the acceleration. I told them, resolve this impediment and you will accelerate by 7%. After three weeks, we saw the acceleration of the 7%. It's numbers, it's data. Reflection and improvement and transparency at all levels. This is the result, well, few of the results. Process efficiency of the way that the team was working from 11% to 37% in three months. And the engineering ratio, the focus, increased from 23% to 60 I mean, think that this company was paying someone a full-time role and 67% uh, of his time was not actually productive. It's a big waste of money and opportunities. And we managed to achieve this by setting up cross-functional teams, trained and upskilled all team members, launched teams around the backlog, and we had high engagement from the executive team. Dependencies, we reduced the dependencies, we broke down the silos, and 37% was reduced and went inside the team, and reduced impediments by 63%. So a lot of things that were slowing down the team removed, identified and removed. Self-managed and autonomous teams, this is how we achieved it. We measured what slowed down the teams. We kept track and metrics. The team was maintaining this. The team was resolving this, not the manager. The manager was only involved in case that the team did not have the power to resolve it. Last but not least, ENPS, Employee Net Promoter Score. It shows how many of your employees entered the silent quit mode. From 19%, we raised it to 44%. And this is the explanation. We were close to excellent. Not many companies have scores above 80%. So the scoring goes from minus 100 to plus 100. And then you ask the people to answer one question. How likely is it for you to introduce your company to your friends and family. And they rate it from one to 10. Nine to 10 <clears throat> are the true loyal employees. Seven and eight are the neutral ones. And zero to six, they entered already the silent quit zone. 
So we do the math, and we have the results over here. It's the simplest thing you can do. But if you do it, you need to have the answers. You need to have the way how to increase it. Don't just do it out of curiosity. Thank you very much. This is what I had to share with you. I hope it was useful and fruitful, and I hope I created also some questions uh, to accept. Thank you. So feel free to shoot me. Yes. A long way to run. Um, about uh, agility. Uh, about agility, yeah. Uh, so um, many years ago, when uh, the development started, everyone used this uh, like um, a waterfall approach, uh, and um, uh, afterwards it was like trend about agility and so on and so on, and everyone really forgot about why uh, the classic approach uh, is worth uh, on some projects, and um, uh, do you have some impediments uh, about? Uh, your way of uh, implementing because for some projects uh, actually it's um, better to use classic uh, approach that's it i couldn't agree more with you we don't compete the waterfall approach we actually give a solution to the companies and unless we have the why we need to change we don't do anything waterfall it's a perfect fit for companies that applies Agility applies in companies that really want to move faster in the market. They need to solve some issues that they were unable to solve them with a waterfall approach. So we've done transformations, having teams and departments working waterfall, Kanban, and Scrum at the same time. The leaders here is the key that they need to connect the dots. All right? Thank you. Yes. Here is mine. Uh, thank you. Uh, how would you, do you have any recommendations on how to integrate a front-end team that's working on Scrum and with the back-end team that's working in Kanban mode? No. Because, as I said initially, we, if we change something with the current backlog or the current way that the backlog is being set up, it's like we are trying to solve the problem by being part of the problem. So we need to go a step back and set up the backlog in such a way that will support this. Currently, it doesn't support it. Do whatever you want. It won't support it. So you need to go back. I accept the failure, yeah. You need to accept the failures. Otherwise, it's like going against the river. So you need to accept. And you start small. So you want to see if this works. So you do a pilot period. You set up a cross-functional team, focused on one product, and you start working on it. You bring some results. If that results are OK, and people love the way that they worked, then you move on and you grow, let's say, the Agile bubble internally. So it's important to have in mind that you need to secure the sustainability of the organization. You cannot just go one day and change everything from day one. It will put at risk a lot of things. So, thank you very much. Ah, last one. We still have one minute. So, thank you for the, your performance. My question about the uh, reactive and proactive way. Could you explain this here? Uh, because I mean some more life example how to show the team that the proactive way is better and involve them to it right because they are not defining the goals of development sometimes when they just um, give it as it is and start doing something but I'm agree hundred percent that the proactive way to consider the future I don't know the problems or something, it's much better if the people who are doing so, they could find it, highlight, and et cetera, if they interest into it. Now, switching from 
reactiveness to proactiveness. It's a process that involves a lot of things in multiple layers. And what do I mean with that? For example, the prediction that I showed, the acceleration, at the first four weeks, we knew that we were going to fail to deliver the project on time. So this is how, it's one way how to be proactive. So you reflect this failure to the team. And then you ask from the team, guys, with this way that we currently work, we're failing. How can we change something so to accelerate? You try it out, you experiment, and you come back after one sprint or a specific period of time, and you see the impact in the metrics. And this is how you're being proactive. You get them involved, you show them, you reflect, and you take decisions. It's too general, I know, but uh, I cannot be specific because every organization is unique like everyone else because we are dealing with people, so people are different, so things are different. Maybe the problems are the same, but people are different. Thank you very much. So, I need to change microphone. I'm going to be the moderator now. <laughs>